success in rowing is only a consequence of hard work. And while the parallels are not quite so simple in business, it still stands that same kind of thing that, you know, if you do the groundwork, you will see results in business. Hello and welcome to Run The Business, the podcast that explores the place where running and leadership come together. We'll find out how running can help us with leading, managing people and generally being better in business. We'll also try and answer that question, do runners make better leaders? I'm Anthony Gay and today I'm joined by a CEO whose business Studio Space acts as a matchmaker for marketing agencies and businesses around the world. A keen runner when he was younger, he now classifies himself as a retired distance runner and despite that he still runs each week and believes there are many parallels between running and being a leader in business which we're keen to discuss in depth today. Peter Saburn, welcome to Run The Business. Thank you very much, great to be here. How are you today? I feel good. I feel strong, Anthony. Looking forward to a great conversation about running and business, my two favourite subjects. And and whereabouts are you in the world, Pete, just to kick off? So I'm in Wimbledon in in southwest London at the moment. And when did you last go running? Oh, I knew you were going to ask me that. So the good news is I went running this morning. So I was up on Wimbledon Common uh, about an hour ago. And what sort of run is that? Tell us, for anybody who's not familiar with Wimbledon Common, tell us what you can see and, and how, how the terrain is up there. Yeah, it's a nice mixture. It's a little bit of a little bit of path, a little bit of uh, off-road. Uh, no, no wombles this morning. But yeah, the sun was shining and it was pretty good. So I did, uh, I did a five-mile loop around the Common this morning. And uh, yeah, it's a good way to start the day. Sounds lovely. This, and this retired distance runner... Uh, name that is, is been attached to you. Tell us about that. Why retired? When did it start and when did it finish? So I, I suppose uh, whether retired or reformed is, is is better. I think once you're a runner, you're always a runner. And I'm sure most people who listen to your uh, channel will, will relate to that. Yeah. But I, I ran competitively as a, at school and as a student. But like many people, I think I sort of, um, you know, waned a little bit in my mid-20s and, and, and my career and, and work took over. But very pleased to have sort of rediscovered my passion for running in the last couple of years. Uh, and even though my times are considerably slower than they used to be, uh, I still get a huge amount of satisfaction out of it and I'm really enjoying it now. Tell us a little bit about your business studio space and what studio space do for, for agencies and for businesses. So we're, a, we're a, a platform that connects up marketing agencies with, with big corporations that need their help. What we realised was that there's there's a whole load of talent out there in, in relatively small independent agencies. You know, these are companies that do research or brand strategy. They make videos, they produce ads, and um, they help you with all sorts of different services. Um, but it's really difficult for these independent businesses to get in with the big brands and you know the FTSE 100 style companies and the FTSE. 100 companies really need their help and find it difficult to bring them in, you know, for various reasons, including procurement processes and, and, and hoops and hurdles that you need to jump through. So Studio Space is a business that brings together the independent agencies on one side with the corporations that need their help on the other side. Think of it like an Airbnb, but for marketing agencies. It sounds so simple. And that's, I think, on the one hand, that's great, isn't it? But I bet it's not. Is, is, is it been a journey in getting studio space to where it is today? Yeah, the, the idea is simple. And, and, and I think that's, that's probably one of the beauties of it. It's that it is pretty much, you know, a, a matchmaking platform. But the complexities that sit behind that um, are largely about how big companies procure services and all of the the admin and the paperwork and the legal kind of side of things, which which is you know, the boring stuff. What the companies want to get on and do is the exciting creative work. And so we solve all those boring problems in the background and, and we and we make it easy for great creative agencies to, to work with great brands. But you're right, the complexities of getting that off the ground were eye-opening. As an entrepreneur, there's always something every day you experience it, you challenge, maybe something that you didn't see coming. Uh, but it's really satisfying to sort of overcome those and 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 see what was just an idea 12 months ago be a real business today. And so we're, we're obviously doing something right. The business is growing 
at a decent rate at the moment. We're signing new agencies every week and, and we're signing new contracts with, with corporations every week. And it's really satisfying to sort of see what was just an idea a year ago become a real business today. So this podcast is all about how running might help people in business and leadership. Tell me about what running does for you and, and how it helps you be better in your work. So I've benefited massively throughout my whole life and career from from the origins of, of you know, my, my running when I was a schoolboy and a student. There are a number of different things that I think I put down to the benefits of running and, and, and how that can enhance your, your business abilities. The first thing that I think is absolutely clear is that I realized very early that success in running is only a consequence of hard work. And if you put the work in, you will get faster. And I really enjoyed that simplicity. It's a system which is quite simple. You know, training equals speed, equals better performance in races. And while the parallels are not quite so simple in business, it's a more complicated system. It still stands that same kind of thing that, you know, if you put the groundwork in, if you work on those relationships, if you think about your products, you consider exactly what your customers need. If you build your team with purpose and, and, and if you invest time in developing members of your team, then you will see results in business. And it's no coincidence that the most successful companies are the ones that have organized themselves in that way. So I see a direct uh, parallel between training to run faster and running a successful business. But, but there are all sorts of dimensions that, you know, that, that make that work and, and, and some that are completely contrary to it. In, in both your thinking about your business and your, your running career, do you think people want things quicker these days? Um, technology has created a sort of mentality of success, whether, you know, that's in business or in running, sh should be more instant. Because I think what you've just described is, is a great lesson that things take time and take effort. People aren't always willing to put it in, are they? Yeah, that's a fascinating error, isn't it? Between the, the 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 time that it does take to achieve success and and your impatience, and and you know, runners are impatient too. We want to see quicker results. We we want to see you know the the results of our hard work immediately in the next week's race or whatever it is. Um, but but you touched on a couple of interesting points there. Technology being one factor, so I, I, I'll come back to that uh, as well as expectations of how quickly. You know, thing, things happen. So if I think about the technology, when I grew up as a, as a, as a teenager and even as a student, I used to check a train at you know, Cambridge Harriers in South East London on a cinder track at Charlton Park with a fantastic group. But we had no facilities whatsoever. You know, literally, it was, it was you know, an old gravel track, which, which we'd, we'd meet and we'd train. Like, no one would have the sophistication that I've got my wrist at the moment in this in this Apple Watch with all of the apps and all of the services that track you know my run this morning. Or we would have come in later on. I can have a look and see exactly what my mile times were. You know the GPS that tracks exactly where you are all times. So there's all sorts of things that have changed, I suppose, in the uh, technology that can help you with uh, your running training. And and the same things happen in business. So there's all sorts of tools that we can now use to communicate with customers better. There's immediate feedback that you get in both senses. So I know exactly how fast I'm running. At the same time, I know exactly how many people are on my website at the moment, what services they're browsing for, whether or not they're likely to, to buy something, and, and you know, which of our marketing activities work more effectively than others. So the pace of technology has changed in both areas, and it's really has it really has opened our eyes to new ways of doing things and, and performance in both areas is, is increased as a result so i think this whole area is really fascinating partly it's expectations about how quickly you can achieve results and partly it's the reality of the technology that we now use has changed how we go about doing business and it's also changed how we go about training and, and running faster and it's a double-edged sword isn't it because you get that data you get that information but it's also overpowering on 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 what on the other hand. I mean, when you think thinking of your business, what are the measures and 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 how often are you looking at that information and making decisions on that information? Yeah, but it's very easy to be overwhelmed by that data and and be and be stuck in this sort of paralysis 
uh, uh, rather than rather than the simplicity and make a good judgment on you know on a simple decision and get on with it. I think as a as a leader in business, you are always wearing a number of different hats, um, and you've got to, the secret, I suppose, is deciding you know which mode you're in at the moment. So there's one which says, look, you need to be completely data led and you need to make, you have to get perfect data for every decision that you make. But if you do that, it's just, you're going to miss the boat. You're going to be too slow. Uh, sometimes you've got to trust your gut and your judgment and just go for that, you know, go for that decision. So in terms of metrics, I mean, the kind of things that we always track, uh, in, uh, uh, you know, in studio space now, the first and most important thing is, is a thing we call liquidity. So it's literally the number of deals across our marketplace, i.e. number of marketing briefs or creative briefs that are posted by our customers and are therefore matched to our agencies. And that single metric in terms of how many briefs, what's the liquidity of our marketplace is probably the most important thing. But then there's a bunch of other metrics that kind of cascade down from there. So, you know, you look at revenue, of course, you know, what's the value and how much you sell it. You look at the ratio of briefs to agencies. So you make sure that you haven't got oversupply in a certain area where the agencies are going to get bored because of course they're not getting any work or you can't satisfy the customer demand on the other side because you haven't got enough agencies. So in all of the areas of business, you can have these kind of metrics and you can track them. And I suppose that's the point is that, you know, it's, it's available, but you mustn't be overwhelmed by that data and sort of slow down in your decision making. It should be the other way around. It's got to be something that makes you quicker and more decisive rather than tied up in knots because you've got too much information and you can't make a simple choice. And thinking of running, what data are you looking at these days when you go running? Because as you pointed out, and I'm in the same boat, we're getting older. And sometimes those faster times, I mean, you were running sub 15 minute 5Ks, weren't you, uh, you know, back in the day? When that time isn't quite as quick. What are the th- objectives and what, what's the data that you put in place when you go on and run these days? Yeah, it's interesting how your, um, your expectations do change in that area, but some of them, though, you're still striving to be the best you possibly can, no matter what your circumstances are. So, you know, what's more important for me at the moment, I, I deliberately only train, uh, say, three days a week at the moment, right? because I know that if I was to train every day, I wouldn't have enough recovery time in between. And I know that's going to cause trouble. Now, I've learned that from experience. And once I've sort of started running again after a long period of time of not running, I've, I've been much more successful in, in, in consistently running three times a week than trying to ramp it up too quickly and, and find myself getting injuries and, and, and other problems. So, um, yeah, distance and duration are obvious things. You know, how many miles are you doing and how long is it taking you? So, yeah, your average sort of mile time or kilometre time. Uh, is important. I always try and do one sort of quality training session a week. So, you know, I'll do, I'll do one, just, just a run, one slightly longer run at the weekend, uh, and then one quality session that would either be um, reps, uh, you know, hill reps or, or, or intervals over um, uh, on the track or, or around the park. Um, and so those sorts of, you know, times to do that is still important to me. Um, if I think back, you know, to when I was training well as a, as a teenager, those quality sessions were everything. I think it was it was probably Peter Cohn who who said, you know, why why would you wear down or break down a young runner with with mileage when you can build them up with quality? And I, and I totally agree with that. You know, if you could do a brilliant sort of two or three. Uh, quality track sessions or hills or, or, or intervals or, or tempo runs. Um, for me, that's much more constructive way of, of getting really strong conditioning and race preparation than it is putting in that 100 or 120 miles a week that, uh, that others might be doing. And how do you manage goals these days? I'm thinking, you know, in this question for both business and, and running, uh, do you set yourself long-term targets? Mm. Definitely for business. Um, I'll come back to the running and to the on that one in terms of goal setting, but in terms of business, yeah, we we have a we've got a very young business, um, only a year old, um, but it is a high growth business and it is one that for the first time we brought some external investment into as well. So we absolutely need to have clear set of goals, um, financial metrics, and also a very really clear plan on you know how do we think we can get there. So if I think the longest 
term is probably over a sort of two or three year period. And that's so difficult to forecast and predict, but you've got to have a bit of a plan for that. So, you know, we're looking for international expansion and to, and to, and to take the business into the North America and the US market, you know, within the next 12 to 18 months. Um, we probably in there, uh, therefore look to get our product platform really robust and scalable in the next six in order to achieve that. We probably need to look for another funding round in November, December, maybe January 2024. So, you know, these sorts of um, very clear milestones uh, are the goals that we're looking at the moment. Uh, the most important thing in the very short term is to prove out this concept because it is a simple idea, but it's a new concept, which is can we aggregate demand for services through a digital platform? Uh, and can we match that to a community of independent agencies um, as a replacement for what is the kind of normal way of doing things nowadays, which is you go to a big holding company, a big advertising agency group like WPP or Omnicomp, and you ask them for all of your marketing services. So, you know, we're, we're setting goals to replace that old fashioned way of doing things, you know, the madman way of doing things from, from the sort of 1960s with, with a digital platform and a community in the way that Airbnb gave travellers a completely different option than just going and staying at one of the mainstream hotels and having the same experience wherever you are in the world. And who inspires you in, in business and, and leadership? Where do you get your drive and motivation from? One of the, I suppose, one of the really um, fascinating aspects of both running and business is, is that sort of role of a, of a coach or a mentor. And, and I think, you know, every athlete, um, you know, has a very clear role that their coach plays. Uh, this was the same for me as I was growing up. Um, and I think, you know, many people have a mentor or, or a coach that helps them, you know, within the business world too. You know, if I think back to when I grew up, you know, there were, there were two people in, in particular uh, in, in Cambridge areas, you know, Barry Ferguson, uh, who, who's fantastic, fantastic character and, and a very active veteran athlete still to this day. Uh, and Rod, Rod Allison, who, who, was, who was my coach as I was a teenager, he, he's a, he, he was a great man and, 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 you know, taught me so much about training methods, but also about mindsets and about how to overcome challenges and confidence and, you know, all of these attributes that young runners develop that then you bring into business. And, and that stands us all in such good stead. And it comes back probably to the core of the, uh, you know, the, the, the topic that you're exploring constantly, Anthony, which is, you know, do runners make better business people? And if so, why? And I think there's some of the characteristics, you know, the stuff that we learned from our coaches as kids around uh, putting in the work and seeing the results around dealing with failure, uh, overcoming hurdles, um, literal and metaphorical, um, you know, teamwork and, and planning and discipline and all of those sorts of things um, stand you in a very good stead when it comes to leadership and business. And, and so when I look at, um, you know, potential new recruits, if someone has got a, a background in, in, in sport in general, or it could be in running or it could be in another field, but it demonstrates some of the same characteristics and some of the same attributes, then that always makes that candidate look more attractive, more capable. You know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a really strong indicator of future performance in business that somebody has achieved um, a good standard and, and learned from the experience of doing that within the sporting environment. You mentioned a few things there. Let's let's pick up pick up on a couple of those points that you made around what running can can give us. Um, overcoming failure and challenges is is something which uh, you mentioned. Can you think of a specific scenario from your career where you had a challenge and something didn't go quite right, and how you overcame that? And maybe you could kind of talk us through it. Yeah, it's it, it's one of the hardest things I think. And it's um, so if I think back to my previous business, so Studio Space is, is my current venture, and it, it's the new business that we've we've launched in the last sort of twelve to eighteen months. Previously, uh, I co-founded and ran for a ten-year period uh, an innovation agency called Market Gravity. It was a fantastic business, brilliant team. We used to design and launch new products and services for big companies. 
uh, ultimately we sold that business to Deloitte Digital, and um, and that was our sort of you know our exit, if you like, from from the first venture. Um, but what we learned from that was um, be really careful not to grow too quickly, and we did get to a point in about year six or seven where we'd taken on slightly too many people, we'd set off in too many directions at the same time, and our sales dipped, our demand dipped for our services, and we found ourselves in a really tricky position where we weren't able to sort of confidently look at the next quarter's revenue thinking, yeah, we're going to be able to, to keep trading through, through this, given the cost base. And so that was probably the hardest time when what you're trying to do is for the first time being challenged commercially and you're looking at the bills and you're thinking, mm, we're going to have to cut some costs here and actually had to, had to think about letting some people go for the first time, which is a horrendous experience for anybody who, who goes through that. But it also, you know, it does make you stronger in terms of your resolve. Um, it's something that if you go through it once, you never want to repeat again. And therefore, learning from those sort of challenges and failures doesn't mean you back off from the challenge. It, it means you're slightly more savvy about how to do it. So maybe we would sort of grow slightly differently, or maybe we would have sort of waited to achieve one milestone before maybe setting out for the next one. Um, and I think failure is such an important part of winning in sport that you can't overlook it from that perspective too. The number of times that we've seen in this sort of, you know, the theatre of the Olympics, and you've seen somebody who's kind of, just lost to gold medal, and that's what you do. You lose gold medals, right, as well as win. If you're expected to win and you don't, it's, it's, it's horrendous. And, and the emotion that most people describe when they win is one of relief because you're meant to win. And, and therefore, overcoming that and dealing with that failure, but then coming back and winning in the next race, I think is probably the best expression of, of, of resolve, of resilience, and of, of, of a true champion. Um, rather than just the ability to win when things are going well. The economy is in a challenging place at the moment. The world's in a, in a, a challenging place. How does a CEO, how do you approach that? Uh, you want to build a business, you want success. The climate isn't quite you know, as it was. And we have potentially a, a year or two of, of tough times ahead. What's, what's your approach to that scenario? So downturns and recessions are really interesting times for an entrepreneur. They, um, they often see the opportunity differently than those who are running a static business and see it purely as risk and as you know, almost fearfully as a downturn in the business. So an entrepreneur, by definition, spots an opportunity, um, grab, grabs it with both hands, does something different to the status quo and maybe swims against the, you know, gets the current for a bit. So, so that's why downturns and recessions are actually, you know, they're times of opportunity for an entrepreneur because it's when change happens and you, and you can grab that. So, you know, my advice to, to, to entrepreneurs is, and this isn't by any means being sort of, you know, ignoring the risks and, 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 and sort of being gung ho about it, but it's when there's a recession, look for brilliant talent that you might otherwise find it quite difficult to recruit or, or to hire in. Um, look for opportunities in, grow, in the few growth sectors that do exist. So, you know, with market gravity, for example, in the, first, in the, in the recession um, back in 2009-10, um, the banks all st stopped uh, investing and, 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 and buying projects. So we focus very heavily on the energy and the utility sector who, who were investing in renewables and, and that was a growth area so you know it's it's a case of being quite savvy about how you trade through a downturn rather than just sort of hunkering down cutting costs and sort of waiting for it to pass i'd, I'd encourage every entrepreneur to be really proactive about how they work through a through a recession or downturn cut the unnecessary costs absolutely never cut the essential things which are to do with your customers or your team you know it's the very much the last resort and seek out those opportunities for growth that maybe others have not uh, seen, um, and, and particularly around securing great talent and building your team so that when you come out the other side, and it might take another uh, six, 12, or even 18 months to happen, uh, you're in much better shape than when you went in. That's great advice. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. 
Can I take you back to your time in Florida? Because you spent um, a couple of years there doing your MBA, didn't you? And uh, you were running at the same time whilst you were there. Tell us about that experience and, and what was it like uh, being in the US and studying there? So the, the whole US system is so well organised uh, for student sport, it's, it's untrue. So you know, again, compared to the UK system, which is, you know, to be fair, still a little bit amateur uh, and, and you know, more a club seen than, than a true uh, sort of performance system. Um, there are exceptions to that, totally agree, but generally that's the case. So I, I went to Florida, did, it, did a, a two-year MBA during that team, was training and running with the, uh, with the team. Um, eligibility was difficult for, for NCAA-type competitions, obviously being a, being a, a postgraduate student, you're not, you're not uh, able to compete in some of the uh, the, uh, the competitions, but I trained every day with the team there. Um, totally opened my eyes to different ways of approaching training and competition. Uh, very professional setup. I mean, on our campus, we had an 80,000 seater stadium. We had an indoor track, an outdoor track, three swimming pools, five gyms, just you name it. The, the health and physio setup was fantastic. So that opened my eyes. Um, the system, however, was set up very much for how do we get the fastest student team rather than how do we get the best athletes at the peak of their careers. And therefore, you did have quite a lot of young athletes over training and, you know, not coming out of the system as, uh, as well prepared for competition in later life and that maybe they would have done. Um, so that was the interesting thing. The, the other thing I took away from it was just a mindset shift in terms of um, performance and, and training methods. Um, I really enjoyed the, the whole um, mixture of cross country in the winter preparation for the track season, you know, some road running during that period of time. Um, and the whole university set up and sort of had a very structured indoor, outdoor cross country season. Um, and that kind of uh, gave, some, gave some, some, some sort of focus to what you were doing at the time. So I really enjoyed that. Um, and being a student gave you the opportunity to carry on training yeah, you know, in a in a in a way that most people in full time work can't do. So the the US university system is is certainly set up to be able to enable that. But yeah, great life experience, lots of friends, lots of opportunities and and, and experiences opened up as a result. If you look back at who you were then, is there any advice if you could give some advice to to the younger you that was there studying in the US? Is is there anything that you'd say to that person? Huh. That's a good question. You know what? I don't know. I think I think I I, I grabbed all sorts of opportunities to, to to explore. You know, different different races, different environments. I you know I, I got my first job back in the UK as a result of people that I've met in the US. Worked in the technology sector as a result of doing it ever since. So you know, the advice was was I think I think I would have told myself to do exactly what you've been doing here. Um, you know, it's it's important that you you recognise the opportunities when they present themselves. I suppose um, that's the case in sport and in business. You put yourself in the right place. One of the coaches in in Florida used to use that phrase exactly. He used to say, you know, you work hard, good things are going to happen. And, and, and you know what he meant was that it's no coincidence. You create you create that luck by putting in the preparation, um, create the opportunities. But when you when you when you get one, grab it grab it with both hands and, and, and run with that. So, um, yeah, that, that was a great experience. I got my first job in the, U in the UK, as I say, as a result of um, uh, an entrepreneur who I met in, in, uh, in the US when I was there. Um, and ever since, I've sort of built upon that. It's, it was a good grounding. And, and I think generally the student sports setup is a really good grounding for business, not just in the US, but, but in the UK as well. Something you touched upon earlier, which comes through in a lot of these conversations is around the people that we surround ourselves with and where we put ourselves in the world, you know, physically. Um, it sounds like you had some great experiences, coaches, uh, support when you were sort of growing up and getting into, into business and into running. And it sounds like you've got a great team that you're working with now. Tell us about what that, what that means to you, what that gives to you, because I don't think we can underplay, can we, this thing of to be successful to have a support team around you, have have talented people around you that that raise everybody's game. 
Yeah, the team the team is everything. It's it's everything in the sporting environment. But I think you still need to, as a as a runner or as a sports person, you have to be really selfish in some ways. You you, you have to sacrifice other things for your own for, for your own success. Now in business, I don't think that's a good formula for success. I think recognition that the collective outcomes are more important than than than, than individual success or, or any single commercial goal. Um, are more important. So a business team really does need to be uh, balanced. It does need to understand how people work together and build codependencies on one another. Um, incentives within teams are complicated. Motivation is complicated. Um, as I said earlier in the discussion, you know, it's a much more complex system maybe than the, than the, 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 the system that running and training and performing uh, is governed by. There are some parallels, of course. So every great sports person has a has a you know, huge team of uh, of people who help them achieve what they achieve. Um, yeah, be that medical, be that training, be that uh, travel, and all the rest of it. Um, but within a business, yeah, the team's huge, hugely important to understand the motivations of your team members and make sure that you create the environment where they can thrive. And that's been a mantra that I've always taken through. We had it at Market Gravity very clearly, a very strong culture of um, performance and achievement, but through collaboration and, 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 and a strong team culture. Um, I, th I think I probably did learn some of that from a sporting environment, but we definitely honed that and developed it more in business. Understanding what motivates people, understanding how to create an environment where they can thrive and be successful and gain a huge amount of satisfaction from other people's success rather than your own is probably something that business leaders have to take further than, than the runners or, or, or performing sports people. Are there any specific examples? We've talked a lot about running. Are there, are there any specific examples of, of running giving you a lesson or a particular run that sticks in your mind as a learning experience that, that you somehow transferred into your work? Hmm. That's, a, that's a really interesting question. The runs that stick in your mind are either locations where you've been to and you've gone running because that's what you do. <laughs> but but there's, so there's some brilliant experience you have. One of the wonderful things about running and consistently a wonderful thing about business is that it takes you around the world. It gives you experiences you wouldn't have had otherwise. Right? So, you know, as a teenager, I, 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 a friend of mine and, and I got a train to uh, what was then Yugoslavia to the European Athletics Championships in Split, 1990. We wouldn't have done that had we not been passionate about the sport. But we got on the train, we went to split, and of course, and we went for a run along the cliff top and, and, then, and then watched, you know, a week of fantastic athletics in the stadium. And I wouldn't have done that had it not been, you know, for, 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 the, for the interest in, in running in the sport and athletics. Right? Similar kind of thing happened yes. in business. So, you know, if I remember my, my last trip, um, where it, b b before I um, left Market Gravity Deloitte and, and we started Studio Space was to uh, was to Singapore and then and then South Africa. So you know it's opened huge uh, opportunities in, and, and fantastic experiences in, in in travel, which have happened as a result of business. Oh, by the way, I went for a run, of course, when I was there, and, and you know enjoyed that because the environments are are, are amazing. But sometimes I forget that. You know, you're running and your business takes you around the world. It opens doors, maybe not just geographically, but you meet people that you would never have met otherwise. So, yeah, that does, that does change. When, when I go out for runs when I'm traveling, you know, you, you clear your mind, you get to think about what you're going to do next. You know, you're often in a change of environment. So rather than taking your problems into that, you're thinking about opportunities. It's a more expansive feeling. When, when I'm running, I'm thinking about all sorts of things. Um, the problem is remembering most of the... You know, it's like you get back again and you think, oh, I had all those brilliant ideas whilst I was out on a run. And, you know, I actually do two or three of them. Probably are the only ones that you can remember once you get back. That's a really good point. And I find myself sometimes on those longer runs where I have that moment of seeming, you know, genius and you, you 
kind of try and remember it. Uh, and it's uh, un- unless you say, I, I find myself repeating whatever it is that I've come up with so many times to try and ingrain it in my brain. So it stays there because it's not easy to stop and write something down when you're in, in the middle of the countryside. No, that's right. It used to be that, you know, when you were in a pub with your friends, you came up with a brilliant idea and you'd, you'd know whether it was brilliant if you still thought it was a good idea the next morning. Right. Once, the, once the beer had worn off. Um, it, maybe it's the same kind of thing when you're out for a run, you have to remember the one good idea that you came up with uh, and, then, and then see after your shower whether it's still that good. Uh, it's a good test. It's a good barometer for whether your ideas might land. And I think that's a good point of, of that moment for reflection and review that we put in place or should put in place that when we have these ideas uh, is is allowing for a little bit of space and then some time to think and reflect on it because that can be really powerful can't it you know what you've reminded me i, I completely re- i c- completely agree with that um reflection it's so important to look back on your results as well as plan ahead for your targets Because without that, you don't get the reinforcement. You don't get the satisfaction of achieving and setting out what you've, you know, sort of reflecting what you've achieved and relating it to what you set out to do. And I think everybody who runs and and has planned maybe their training, you know, can relate to that, where you'll then look back at that diary or that log or that app over the last few months and you'll see the charts track up and down and you'll see the average time come down or up you know <laughs> and, and looking back and reflecting on it a it's fascinating and it reminds you of all the stuff that you've done and it's just good fun right and b it reinforces sort of the ah okay so when i actually introduced that hill training sort of session for those two or three months you know i did manage to get you know better performance as a result of it. Or I did manage to, you know, overcome a particular injury that I had because I changed from roads to grass or whatever it is, you know. And in business, it's the same kind of thing. I think we're quite good in business at reflecting back, you know, looking back at the end of the month and the quarter, tracking performance and knowing why did 